Good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this uh, interesting Congress and also in this symposium. Well, my role in this uh, presentation is to, to tell you a, a different tale of stories that the, we, we have heard during the press first presentation. The, the tale story is starting with the European Commission recognized uh, at the European Parliament and also at the DG Sante, which is in charge of the strategies, health strategies, that we don't have a good strategy for autism spectrum disorder. Thus, uh, therefore, the European Commission launched a call for tenders in 2014 and we participate in this call for tenders and bid, uh, won this bid, and that's why the autistic spectrum disorder in the European Union was approved. This is the list of all participants in this consortium. We are more than 20, well, 20 associated partners plus two uh, collaborating partners. We are 14 member states, although some others have shown the, their own interest in to collaborate. And Autism Europe are very engaged in the project because it's a full uh, partner as well as uh, National Autistic Society. And the project will be finished in, in February 2018. These are the, the, the list of the main activities, objectives, uh, when, although there are several outcomes and several deliverable, deliverables that we need to send to the European Commission in, a, in a specific de deadlines. But I would like to revise uh, briefly the, the two or three activities from uh, several work packages because the other work packages will be commented by other speakers that are sharing with me the, this table. The, one of the most challenging work packages is the work package one that co uh, contains two different tasks. One is the prevalence and one is the economic burden. The prevalence, uh, we are uh, focused on the prevalence uh, approaching with different methodologies. One is the methodology basis in population-based registries, which means that there are five areas, uh, including four co European countries. And then we are more or less estimating that the prevalence where we can make some inference will be near to 480,000 people regarding the uh, seven and nine years old. Uh, at the same time, other eight uh, European member states will be engaged with uh, to conduct a, a study fields on prevalence to estimate the prevalence in the same age ranges. And also, the, more or less, the, 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 the population that we are estimating that we are uh, as a target population will be more or less 160,000, 170,000. And we are approaching with these different methodologies. When in some cases, the screening will be using in all the school, all children in, in, in these ages in this, at the school year, uh, using only the ACQ as a, a first uh, screen level. But in, in other cases, we are using one uh, other approach, which means is uh, using a, a, a teacher nomination uh, strategy we, uh, after that, we are using the ECQ, and finally, we try to uh, make a, a, a rich diagnosis using AIDOS or ADR. This is more or less the, the criteria for the prevalence study. The, uh, in, at the same time, the, pre the work package one, including the task one, task one are uh, addresses to uh, health burden and economic burden, which means that we are collaborating between uh, Martin Knapp uh, teams and we are estimating the overall cost, but also the disability adjusted lab years, and also the economic impact of the screening a population at the two years old uh, using the, the data. We had more than 20,000 children screening in Spain. In, in the work package two, and yesterday we had the opportunity to hear to, in one of the sessions to our colleagues, uh, Ricardo Canal, we are uh, addressing the idea how the, the what, what, what will be the evidence about the early intervention, early diagnosis, early, early detection. We are using different methodologies, not only the literature review, the meta-analysis, etc., but also uh, uh, more than 29 fo focus groups have been developed with several uh, important criteria and also uh, aims at achieve in this kind of a focus group. The, the most important uh, uh, results up to, up to date has been that the early detection, the age of the detection, is one of the most important things, apart of other, uh, including in, in this uh, focus group discussion. And regarding the early intervention, the specific service is also important. Just the, uh, 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 Herbert Rogers is in charge also to detect what is the evidence for new biomarkers, biomarkers, traditional biomarkers from the biological viewpoint, and also socio-communication biomarkers, which is also important for us. 
where the World Package 3 will be commented by Diana Sender immediately. Uh, and then just to say that the Autism Europe is in charge to prepare the, the policies that we can, we can uh, suggest to the European Commission in order to be implemented for the future, which is, is important in this part. The, the relation with the UNS is also one of the major tasks in, in our collaboration because it was mandatory in the call for tenders. And there are other, other work packages such as dissemination, etc. One of them is leading by the uh, National Autistic Society, which Carol Powie is the, the responsible for that. Just to say that the final conference, when we send, uh, we present all the results, will be more or less at the end of November on, on or the first week in December in, in Madrid. And I will invite you, all of you, we can attend this to show all the results. Thank you very much. So good morning. So I'm Diana Schendel, and I'm going to be just saying a few words about what the ASDEU consortium is doing in the area of adult services and care. So as you know, the research focus in, in autism is primarily in children. This has to do a lot with the fact that uh, autism has a childhood onset, but also because of the huge increase in prevalence in, of autism in children in, the, in recent decades, which is, of course, leading now to a rising wave of diagnosed adults. But I think it's clear that today, most persons over the age of 20 years with autism are probably undiagnosed. The research base in adult services and care is actually very thin. Um, there's very few researchers and very few studies. And one might argue that the research base is underdeveloped and possibly inadequate for making uh, sound policy and program decisions. So what are we doing in the ASDU consortium in this area? We're looking at adult services and care in five areas. We're looking at multidisciplinary approaches to services and care, the management of comorbidity, the diagnosis and post-diagnosis support for individuals who are diagnosed in, in with autism in adulthood, managing major transitions in adult life, and care for the autistic elder. The first task that we undertook was an information search, and we were, the goal of this was to better understand the organization of services and the local policies and recommendations for, for autistic adults. So we're looking at local publications in terms of policies, published guidelines, published recommendations, to identify the key players in each area regarding adult services and the key informants who could give us further information. This slide shows some uh, results of this information search. It's, I don't expect you to focus on each individual one, but it simply portrays how we've organized the results of this search. So that in the blue boxes for each country, it illustrates the key players, key organizations at the national level regarding adult services uh, for adults with autism. In the yellow and green boxes are the similar uh, key players at the regional or municipal level. And in the pink areas, we have the private sector contributors. So obviously, it's very different across sites, but it does give you a snapshot within each country of what's going on and how it's organized. We also ask sites to map out the uh, local autism-specific organizations in each country. Clearly, the number and distribution of these organizations differs from country to country, but one clear thing that comes out of this mapping is that most of these organizations are clustered in major urban areas, in particular the capital cities. Um, the reports that we're getting from these information ser searches are extraordinarily rich, but one of the main themes that's emerging is the balance between the public and private sector in, in, with regard to the delivery of adult services. Um, so in this graph, I'm trying to illustrate the public sector, both the national level and the regional and municipal level, as well as the private sector. So at, that, at the initial level, we have services for adults in general uh, provided at the, at the public level, but primarily persons with disabilities, and there are no specific autism-specific services. And in this level, the primary source of services is provided by the, uh, the private sector. At the next level, we begin to see public-private collaboration at the national level to design specific autism policies. We begin to see the beginnings of, of public provision of services in the public sector in the regional and municipal level. But in most cases, this, the public sector is providing the funding and the private sector is providing the service. And at the next level, we see the establishment of autism-specific plans at the national level and the provision of autism-specific expertise at the national level autism-specific services being provided at the regional or municipal level, but still the um, private sector is a robust partner. 
I think in summary, we see enormous variation um, in this balance of public and private sector um, across countries and within countries. But the private organizations clearly are the core knowledge and competence base, and in many cases are the primary providers of services for autistic adults. However, within, within a country, we see still enormous variation in the geographic distribution of service provision, as I said, tending to cluster in major urban areas. Um, a, even within a country, there may be significant variation in the public-private balance that I've described across different regions, even within a country. Um, also, finally, given that the private sector is a very important contributor to adult services, um, we, I think we have to be aware that the level of development and the specialization of services that are being provided by the private sector may, in fact, um, be quite limited and might vary considerably from region to region. Another thing that we're doing is an online survey, which is designed to better understand the knowledge and availability of services in each local area, to actually get the true experiences of what's going on in each area. We have three versions of the survey. One is for the professionals who are at the front lines of delivering services, also versions for the adults and their primary caregiver. The content of the survey includes background knowledge of the person who's answering the survey, their general knowledge about services, for uh, professionals, we're asking about awareness of autism in the workplace, and then we ask about a variety of medical and non-medical services, transitions, and services and care for the elderly. So where did we get the questions? We used as the content, the source of content for our questions as published guidelines and recommendations for services for autistic adults. So that's the content of the question, and then we use the answer choices for, uh, for the respondent to choose the answer that that person believes most closely fits the local situation. Now, I think I have to acknowledge that we know that many of these published guidelines and recommendations that we're using as the, the content for the questions, in most instances, these recommendations have not been rigorously evaluated in a scientific study. So we can't honestly say that it's the best way for autism adult, autistic adult services, but it, they, they serve as a common starting point that we can use to compare across the EU. So this is just an example of a question that illustrates how we're using this, this, the content and the, re, and the responses. The question reads, and this is for a service provider, if you suspect a client that you work with has autism, does your current workplace have guidance on what you should do? And then the answer choices are yes, or no, but my workplace has plans to get it started, or no, but I believe that it may be helpful, or no, and I believe that it is not needed now at my workplace, or don't know. We're also asking all responders to give us um, uh, uh, recommendations for good service practices in particular areas that they believe might serve as important models. So for example, in this question we ask, do you know of an employment service for adults in your area or elsewhere in your country which works very well for autistic adults? And if they answer yes, we ask for the name and where is it located so we can follow up. So in, fine, in conclusion, our final report, we hope to I'd be able to describe current practices of care across the EU care practices that are in place but perhaps need improvement or where there are still gaps in service provision, suggestions for improvements in this area, and again, as I say, highlighting local programs that might serve as um, models for other areas to follow. Thank you. Um, hello. Um, uh, uh, good morning. So I'm going to be just describing some of the work that we've been doing for the past four year, uh, years in the EU AIMS um, uh, consortium. Um, this um, um, was um, uh, um, a slide that was written um, by my colleagues um, uh, uh, some, it was, uh, um, some four or five sort of years ago. It was just sort of trying to sort of think from a strategic sort of view about treatments for autism within sort of Europe and um, um, what some of the challenges that sort of lay ahead for our consortium as we um, began to undertake our work um, were. And you can see them here on the sort of bullet points about the lack of sort of strategy, um, 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 really very sort of um, minimal and, and very uncoordinated um, efforts between academics and industry in terms of um, drug discovery, no um, network of people conducting preclinical studies, um, uh, um, uh, so people were doing things in a very uncoordinated way. No established sort of um, network of sites who could in future participate in cl uh, clinical trials. Uh, no contact between um, any of the partners, academics or industry, and the regulatory agencies who oversee um, uh, medicines within the European context. And then some of the things that my colleagues have already uh, highlighted from the ASD EU network were things that you'll be very familiar with. 
late diagnosis, um, um, certainly in childhood, um, poor awareness of autism in adulthoods, um, poor knowledge of um, uh, patients' needs across, uh, across the life course, and um, a range of treatment strategies, but, but, but many with limited evidence of um, efficacy. So um, to, to try and move some of these sort of issues forward, um, uh, um, uh, um, a group of um, academic and industry partners um, um, uh, um, formed a consortium. This is just sort of a, a one slide just sort of providing a sort of context for what we do and don't know about sort of autism. So I think some of the things around um, um, uh, the diagnosis, it's obviously, uh, as you know, you know, currently based on the behavioral profile, um, no medications that improve the core symptoms of autism, some medications for commonly co-occurring conditions, but not always well established as to whether they work in the same way in individuals on the autism spectrum as they do in other patient groups who don't have autism. And then in terms of thinking about treatment development, the, the really our understanding of some of the underlying mechanisms that lead to the presentation and experience for individuals with autism are poorly understood. Very wide heterogeneity, both in terms of the behavioral presentation, in terms of the genetic underpinnings, and in terms of the etiology, in terms of why um, development has gone in a different way for individuals on the autism spectrum than it does for individuals who are more neurotypical, and a lack of personalized medicine approaches that in essence sort of limits choices for patients and family members as opposed, uh, uh, in terms of the treatment options they, they have available before them. Just, just sort of one motivating factor for many of us, at least the clinicians involved in the consortium, and there are many basic scientists that, that also do work I'll mention in brief, that in the clinic, I've been working in clinical services for 25 years, diagnosing sort of uh, children um, uh, um, uh, and working with families. And these are very common sort of questions parents ask us in those consultations. What does the future hold for my child? Um, what's ca caused his or her autism? And what are the options for treatment? You know, are there things that could improve um, um, the future for my child? This is an established sort of mechanism that's been um, um, around since 1910. It's called the Innovative Medicines Initiative, and it's a joint initiative between the European Commission and the um, European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associated Partners, FPIA. Um, it's recently had its funded extended to 2024. So this is a huge investment, both by the European Commission and by industry partners. Um, um, to do the work mostly um, um, to date about sort of pre-drug sort of basic science development for um, diseases, you know, um, and conditions of, of, of any type across um, medicine. This is a, a consortium that we formed. Um, it um, uh, um, was um, formed in uh, uh, April 2012. It um, uh, has a five-year timeline that we think will be extended for a, uh, um, uh, for a sixth year because we have unspent sort of budget. And it's a very large consortium of academic and industry partners, primarily in um, um, Europe, but also with some connections to um, uh, um, Autism Speaks in, um, uh, um, in the USA. So um, there are 14 academic partners, seven industry partners, um, we've had some engagement with Autism Europe, and I'll be mentioning something sort of later on, as well as with the Autism Speaks group from North America. There are more than 200 scientists working within the consortium in 12 countries, and I'll just describe some of the work, focusing mostly on some of the clinical programs that we're running, and these are the um, leads and the science coordinator from um, the various lead partners. So this is a sort of um, it's complicated sort of um, consortium that works right across from the sort of very basic biology of trying to understand um, uh, things in development at a biological level that may be associated with autism to that include um, understanding um, cellular and neurodevelopmental processes, understanding more about the genetics um, that seem to underlie um, autism and, and how that may differ between different individuals to do what we call translational science that involves sort of working with everything from sort of animal models to understanding how techniques such as brain imaging can help us understand more about um, differences in the way that individuals with autism process information and perhaps how that changes over development and how that can be impacted on by um, um, uh, by outside influences as well as clinical research which I'll mostly be focusing on um, today. Um, so these are the sort of general sort of ambitions of the sort of network when we sort of set out. So we were wanting to do work on developing and validating translational approaches to um, 
um, do the basic science of what we call drug discovery, um, developing novel therapies to treat autism or uh, co-occurring conditions, setting new standards across Europe in research and clinical development to aid in that process, and identifying a group of clinical uh, uh, experts, sites across Europe that could be involved in running both the clinical studies that we've been sort of funded to do within the current um, funding timeline, but in future to be a sort of platform for, for, for doing um, um, cross-national trials, um, um, both psychological and uh, pharmacological. So I'm not going to be talking about any of the basic sort of science, but there are certainly challenges for basic science in autism that there are, you know, um, are, are many different causes, many autisms, as lots of the biological science um, uh, scientists remind us. But, but there are things in terms of some of the common brain mechanisms and pathways in neurodevelopment that seem to be associated with some of the um, uh, underlying biology and genetic sort of factors. There are also challenges in sort of clinical trials, the heterogeneity, the presentation, um, both at a sort of behavioral level, but also in terms of levels of functioning, but also in terms of underlying um, heterogeneous um, etiology and biology means that sort of one treatment, you know, either psychological or pharmacological would not necessarily work for all patients, but identifying true subgroups who, 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 who may respond differently to different treatments um, has not happened yet in, um, uh, in the autism field, either in terms of psychological therapies or in terms of um, pharmacological therapies. So I'm just going to touch on a couple of the patient cohorts that, um, um, uh, that we've been sort of studying to do some of this sort of um, more, more sort of clinical translational sort of science. Um, and I'm going to be talking about two of these um, um, here. And one is um, uh, about studying infants at family risk. I'll just mention in brief. Um, another is a, a cohort of um, diagnosed individuals from childhood to adulthood that I'll also mention. And then we have some um, particular groups who are looking at individuals with autism who have um, um, rare but what we call very penetrant copy number variations. Um, um, rare but, um, um, but sort of clinically significant duplications or, de or deletions in genetic structure that are highly associated in outcome with the autism phenotype. Um, oh, let's switch on without me knowing. Um, um, as well as um, uh, uh, individuals who you know, have um, what are already well established um, 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 uh, genetic syndromes that are highly associated with autism. So we're studying a number of um, those. So um, fragile X and tuberosclerosis and um, female McDermott syndrome are three that we're currently sort of studying. And the idea is um, by studying. Um, uh, these different groups of individuals with autism that, um, um, that range from infants at risk to adults with these sort of um, well-established but little understood um, genetic sort of um, conditions at the levels um, on the sort of graphic there in terms of understanding more about their behavior and cognition and development, understanding something about their brain structure, function and biochemistry, um, 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 measuring what we can about the cellular and uh, molecular level as well as various forms of genomic analysis. Just to give an example, and I'm not going to be presenting sort of um, data partly because although this consortium has been running for the best part of four and a half years, these clinical studies are all longitudinal and they take, an, uh, you know, they take a very long time, but we are beginning to um, uh, get to the point of having our first publications. I'll show you one slide that we've never shown before in sort of public just of some of the value we think of having these large cohorts of patients. This is a consortium. Um, that existed before the EU AIMS funding, but is partly supported by the EU AIMS funding, and it's, it's, it's a consortium called Eurosib. So this is nine sites in seven countries who study from the first few months of life infants who have an older brother or sister with a diagnosis of autism. We know because the family recurrence rate is about 10% of a subsequent child having meeting criteria for ASD if you have a child with a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, that if you study those infants through the first few years of life, you can sometimes look to track different early markers of what may um, um, uh, differentiate those infants who go on to have autism uh, versus those who um, don't. So we're at the moment, I think, aiming for something like recruiting 350 to 400 um, high-risk infants that, who have an older brother or sister, studying them through the first three years of life to understand more about the early developmental processes um, and um, studying um, uh, uh, control groups of low-risk infants through those years who, who, who don't have a family 
history of autism. And we you know, don't have the time in this sort of overview to sort of show, show you what we're doing, but we're doing a whole lot of measurement around various environmental sort of factors, both at the biological and the family and the sort of parent-child interaction level. We're using various technologies to measure brain development and um, function, um, including um, 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 magnetic resonance imaging, brain imaging, um, uh, near-infrared spectroscopy is another non-invasive form of brain imaging, and um, EEG and ERP, so electrophysiological activity in the brain. We're doing a whole range of behavioral and cognitive tasks um, using uh, um, uh, uh, eye tracking and uh, interactive experiments with babies and toddlers, and a, a range of genetic things, including um, some family genetics in part of the sample where we get what are called quads, so we get genetic information on the mother and father, on the proband who has an, who's older, who has a diagnosis of autism, and on the um, infant um, um, at family risk, as well as some um, um, gene expression um, analysis to see how gene expression profiling over time might relate to some of the brain and behavioral differences that we see. Um, we don't have any output from these studies yet, but it will be coming the first outputs, we think, between now and the end of the year. Um, here's the other second sort of um, cohort. It's called the Longitudinal Autism, uh, uh, European Autism Project. It's a longitudinal accelerated um, cohort design where we're seeing children from the age of six to adults at the age of 35 taking part in two-day visits and doing a very large range of assessments that involve clinical assessments, cognitive assessments, eye tracking, the same sorts of brain structure and function measures we do in the infant sort of study and the same sort of biochemistry and genetics. So this just shows you where we've got to is from, the, um, from August this year. We finished our baseline assessments. It's, it, it, it's um, by far the largest sample that's been acquired that has what we call such deep phenotyping that we've measured every level we can um, within these individuals that range from um, children to sort of adults. And the sample um, 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 has, um, is large as 431. Um, uh, individuals with a diagnosis of autism and, and nearly 300 um, controls who don't have autism. And we're just undertaking the first analysis sort of right now. Um, the first paper is being submitted next week and the second one the week after that. But just to show you sort of one thing that you can get in terms, this is just a simple symptom measure, slightly off the slide, but it's a social re reciprocity scale. It's a parent report of um, um, severity of autism symptoms. And there, there are 300 and... Um, 31 dots, you have to have a score in this measure to be in the sort of sample. It's one we can look at across the sort of lifespan. It just sort of shows you that, 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 um, that there are slight increases, but they're not significant between the youngest children and the, and the adolescents, and then clear decreases between adolescence and adulthood in terms of sort of symptom severity. Obviously, this is a rather crude global sort of score, but this sort of sample um, provides us with enormous power. And all of the participants you know, on this slide have also been through the whole of the very complicated assessment procedure that I've described. Here's a different sort of thing we've been doing, developing a network of um, 93 uh, clinical sites in 37 countries, um, um, and getting information about their diagnostic practices um, and what we call their trial readiness. So this is a paper we published um, earlier in the year looking at um, what measures are used across those sort of sites in terms of assessment. These are standard clinical assessments for autism, looking at some geographical differences between north, south, east, and west, but just really looking at um, how commonly these measures are used. So one of the ambitions would be to um, align, increase the alignment of measurement across these clinical sites that would be useful for future science. We've also been engaged for the past 18 months with the European Medicines Agency. So the um, assessments in the LEAP cohort, that longitudinal uh, cohort of diagnosed patients, children and adults, have, we've had what's called qualification advice for the European Medicines Agency, and there's a paper from the end of last year that describes this sort of process. So this is unprecedented in, um, um, in the field to have uh, um, a large range of measures uh, by which we receive advice about the possible use of these measures in various ways in clinical trials as either what we call stratification or predictive markers or indeed um, what are called surrogate outcomes. Um, and we've also been collaborating with um, um, American groups who are funded by both NIH and, um, and the regulatory agencies there. We've been um, getting sites to, to share data with each other um, of some of the common clinical measures, 
At the moment, we have um, data on more than 5,000 individuals with autism you know, in a single data set. Um, it's based in London. That's why the big circles are in sort of London, but, but from right across um, um, the, um, the European network. And we've been um, doing an exercise on developing trial capacity, seeing what sorts of things um, the sites have and identifying um, levels of expertise, uh, levels of um, what are called good clinical practice and quality control within um, those sites with a view to thinking about um, how we can build capacity by providing training and input into sites you know, um, to, 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 to increase the number of sites who could take part in future clinical trials. We've also held public events. Here's one that was held in London um, with um, a range of stakeholders, including individuals with autism on the panel, parents, philosophers, and biomedical F, uh, uh, experts um, about the promises, perils, and politics of pharmacological intervention. Um, we've also been collaborating with the ASD EU network, um, which you've heard about, um, and um, I'm a member of that network, and we exchange information across these two networks. It's an interesting um, uh, and important, I think, sort of way of joining up sort of basic science funding with um, um, the European Commission health policy. And then we've got some new plans for 2017. We're going to be launching some webinars, both aimed at researchers and professionals, and we hope jointly we've met with um, Aurelie and Susanna at the end of last year to talk about the possibility of holding a webinar um, aimed at parents and communities. And we're going to be trying to fill the gap in terms of sort of are there ways we can build capacity for the next five to ten years in terms of clinical trials across Europe. Um, thank you very much. So why, uh, why did we uh, also took part in this uh, campaign to have uh, this call from the European Parliament for a European strategy for autism? Because, uh, and why a EU approach? Because we know there's many common challenges identified across uh, the European Union, and that by working at the European level, we can really foster uh, cooperation and identify good practices uh, to be shared. And we know that there's also a need for harmonization uh, that would help, for example, autistic people to enjoy their freedom of movement across the European Union, uh, for example, a recognition of diagnosis uh, and so on. Um, as mentioned by Susanna, the role of Autism Europe was first to assess the existing policies in relation uh, to autism or affecting autistic people across uh, the European Union. So one of the tools we have used is to launch an online survey um, addressed um, to, um, to all stakeholders, meaning families, autistic people, and um, other stakeholders such as professionals. Uh, we've uh, disseminated it across uh, 28 member states, and we uh, are still at the stage of uh, analyzing all the results, but here is some of the main uh, uh, replies that we've received so far and some suggestions from respondents. So, um, most of the respondents have stressed the need to reduce red tape and speed up diagnosis in young children, the need for harmonized guidelines for diagnosis in Europe, the need to improve access to diagnosis uh, of adults, uh, suggestion for creating a specific contact person or one-stop shop in all uh, countries for any question related to autism. Um, people were also highlighting the fact that there's a need for implementation of existing policies and legislation and not only concentrating on passing new laws. Um, again, the, the issue of the freedom of movement on, and of the harmonization and the need of, for training was particularly highlighted as well. Um, people also underline that they want to see more uh, employment and training uh, opportunities uh, for uh, autistic people and uh, the need for uh, offering reasonable accommodation. Uh, so it, it goes hand to hand with providing uh, more vocational training for young people and um, also um, more support for autonomy as well as access uh, to care and uh, to care in general. So we, we, we see clearly that this com the common challenges identified in general are late or inadequate diagnosis, poor access to intervention, lack of proper lifelong education and vocational training, lack of social rehabilitation, lack of access to employment, social exclusion, and lack of awareness. So that's the initial results, and we will uh, 
published in full. We were also looking at um, existing policies and uh, literature review, and um, looking also, for example, uh, in the context of the monitoring of the UNCRPD uh, at uh, uh, the review of the CRPD committee of the UN body which examines the implementation of the UNCRPD, as well as report from civil society. And through all this uh, literature review, we can, we can say that the response to autism spectrum uh, disorders is very diverse uh, in Europe. Um, that the, but uh, the ratification of the UNCRPD has had uh, some impact uh, on autism uh, service provision at uh, various levels. We see a gradual deinstitutionalization uh, taking place across uh, the European Union, so more um, focus on community living. Um, and there's also more uh, inclusion of uh, children in uh, mainstream educational settings. Um, we also see measures to promote access to employment, but um, the implementation is not uh, satisfactory well at the moment. Um, and over the last decade, uh, many countries have also adopted autistic, uh, aut sorry, autism specific policies. Uh, it varies from single policies to uh, whole encompassing uh, strategies in some countries. Uh, currently, some member states have, um, have these plans, such as France, as you know well, uh, the UK. Uh, Hungary had developed the strategies a few years ago. Denmark, uh, Italy and Ireland also have such uh, legislation. Two countries are currently uh, developing uh, strategy and legislation, respectively, Spain and, and Malta. And in other countries, we've seen that there is an autism-specific uh, recommendation that are um, implemented via more mainstream instruments. So what are the initial conclusions of uh, our report? Uh, we've seen uh, that this autism-specific uh, legislation and strategies have uh, an impact uh, to some extent, and that uh, to have an impact, they, they, they need the following characteristics. So practical approach. Uh, identification of the specific needs of, of people uh, on the autism spectrum, uh, consulting also with families and carers. Uh, they have to de though design in close partnership with autism organization and after uh, public consultation. What is very important is to allow for flexibility, to allow for revision of, uh, of these strategies without having to go through formal procedures. Um, and to do that, it, uh, it also needs an ongoing monitoring. And um, together with a practical approach, there, are, there needs to be a direction and coordination of services at national and regional levels. And of course, to implement all of this, uh, adequate public funding uh, is needed. Uh, so that's where the initial conclusion. What are the next steps? Uh, within the ASDU project. We will enhance uh, consultation with all uh, stakeholders um, in order to really uh, finalize the assessment of the situation across Europe. So uh, everyone is very welcome to send uh, feedback and input from all countries. They will be analyzed and reviewed. We will identify uh, common gaps and needs across Europe and uh, to see how they can be uh, best addressed at the European level, because not everything can be addressed at the European level. Some, some issues will um, remain um, dealt with uh, at the national level. We have to take into account the European added value. And finally, we will uh, prepare policy recommendation for a public health plan uh, for autism that will be submitted uh, to the European Commission, and then we hope that it will uh, foster uh, the adoption in the longer term of a European uh, strategy for autism. Thank you. Hi, hello, uh, good morning. Thank you very much for uh, the presentation. I have a question for Autism Europe and the European strategy. I was wondering regarding the consultation, if the data would be made publicly available, the answers, and if you are going to prepare some 
um, information of the level of uh, response per country, and if you would have also some country recommendations, because I believe there is also some um, uh, best experience in some countries that others could uh, follow on, or especially in building their own strategies. Thank you. Um, yes, indeed, the result of the consultation will be published shortly and we will have an, an analysis per country. Uh, you will see uh, the, poli the existing policies in each country. We will also, in the next stage, really try to uh, identify what are the best practices in order to come up with a recommendation. Thank you. And there was another question just down here. The lady. In the Thank you. Adela Tarpan, I'm uh, from uh, FEDRA, Federation for Rights and Resources for People with Autism from Romania. I have a question for Professor Posada. Uh, in EU AIMS, you mentioned um, among partners, one partner from uh, Romania, but also in the work packages, you mentioned that um, data are gathering from, tw from 12 countries. And I was wondering if Romania is providing data um, and also, if um, no data are providing for all world packages, how we could contribute more? Because there are uh, evidently lots of universities, of lots of professionals that would wa want to contribute. Thank you. Thank you for this important question, and, and also interesting for you because you are from the Romania. Uh, the colleagues that are she is working in, in, from Romania. He's participating mainly in the prevalence study, but also in across uh, other work packages. Because at the end, the consortium try to, all of, uh, although some specific partner has a main mission, but at the end, the collaboration across work packages are also important. That's why the intention of the focus group, the intention of the provided data in terms of economic uh, and other kind of social disabilities, etc. The question is that uh, in the next few weeks, uh, the consortium will be launch, will launch uh, several surveys, surveys for, uh, to, get, to gather data from the economic data and also for the adult life. That is why the, the participation and the, the, the main important is not the, what is his, what is the responsible uh, the responsibility for the partner, but the, what is the participation of the parent organization, the professional organization, in the uh, uh, next activities. Which is I encourage you to participate and to stimulate the participation of all the parent in the in the next act, action of the ASDU project. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> There's a, another question just here. Oh, and then this lady who's waiting. Thank you. Um, so one of the problems, I think one of the obstacles we have in the UK at the moment is that we don't have any national level autistic led organizations, representative bodies um, put together and, and run by autistic people. Um, and that makes consultation in research and policy with the autistic community directly quite challenging because you're just starting from scratch every time recruiting people from, from the community. Um, so I wondered if the panelists, any of the panelists, were aware of countries where there is good autistic-led representation and if there are any kind of models of best practice that could be replicated. And I'm also wondering what the panelists feel organisations like Autism Europe or the research community, whether we have a role to play in supporting that process or not. Um, indeed, um, participation of autistic people is extremely important. Uh, from what we know, it's true that it's, it's difficult to have a, a, a unified network in mo most of the countries. Uh, in some countries, there is a mixed organization where there is really uh, participation on par of, uh, from what we know, autistic people and uh, parents even if it might not be at the, exactly where we wanted to, to see it. Sorry. Uh, at Autism Europe, we are trying now, at the moment, to develop uh, the participation of uh, autistic people in the network. So we would really like to establish more contact with the autistic-led group. So um, you're very welcome to come and 
talk to us during the Congress as well about that. We'd be very happy to, to see how we can really enhance cooperation um, and make sure that you are properly consulted. And um, yeah, there is a need indeed for more uh, uh, inclusion uh, within our structures as well. Uh, and we are working towards that. So we hope we will have the opportunity to talk with you. Okay, thank you. This is another question. Hi, uh, my name is Jennifer Green. I'm an educational and child psychologist based in London. My question is to Tony Charman. Um, we have kind of across Europe, America, for probably about the last 40 years, invested billions and billions of pounds into the causes of autism. And we're continuing to invest the money in this. Where we've got to is that there's no single cause and there's quite a lot of links, as you said yourself, there's a huge diversity in the etiology and the heterogeneity of it. So I've got two questions. One is, um, what, when it's, we do recognize that we diagnose it behaviorally, what evidence is there that there is a need to treat it medically? And why are we not investing the money to look at behavioral and non-medical interventions, which I know families, individuals with autism are, are, are looking for, rather than billions continuing to be invested into the medical causes. And then my second question is, as the EU aims research is funded, or a lot of it, the money is funded by the pharmaceutical industry, how open and ethical are you being in um, discussing the aims of the project? and when you're going to report the outcomes of the project. Because as we know, the pharmaceutical industry's aims um, would be to come up with the drugs that they can sell to people to make money. Okay, okay. Uh, I, um, well thank you for your question. It's, it's quite, a lot of, quite, quite a lot of questions that are quite complex embedded in that. I'm not gonna try and attempt to answer them all. Let me, let me just, 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 just say one thing, which is, um, certainly in the European context, I'm not sure I would say even over 40 years, billions has been invested in necessary to under, uh, trying to understand better at different levels. The heterogeneity, the, the, the spend in the US is much higher than in uh, millions for sure, but not billions. Um, in terms of, um, you know, um, um, the, in terms of sort of many areas of sort of, you know, complex neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric conditions, I think sort of, you know, we're still in a period let's say since you know, um, autism was first formally recognized you know, in the 1940s, as you'll know, well obviously it existed before then. Um, it's really only been the sort of um, um, subject of sort of scientific research for um, um, four or five decades sort of at most. That's in sort of science terms, that's a relatively sort of short time. So, you know, um, I think um, I wouldn't say that sort of um, the, the feeling of a majority of scientists, and this might be just sort of rather self-fulfilling, because scientists might be quite enjoy what they're doing and want to sort of go on sort of doing it, that we feel that we're the at the end of the road, that the, I think there may be um, sort of meaningful subgroups, you know, at the behavioral level, at the cognitive level, at the etiological level, that will tell us something about how individuals might respond both to psychological interventions and possibly to pharmacological interventions you know, in the future. I, I would say that the jury is not out on that and I don't think that's a sort of lost hope. Um, in terms of um, psychological interventions versus pharmacological interventions, you know, I, I personally, I mean, I, I'm someone who actually is involved in behavioral and psychological interventions of various sorts and have been for the past sort of 20 years. You know, um, personally, you know, I, I happen not to have been involved in pharmacological sort of um, in, uh, um, trials, but I wouldn't at all rule out being involved in them in the sort of, um, 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 in the future. I, I, I mean, as a clinician, I'd say that, you know, I think it may be that sort of, um, in future, both those op opportunities for sort of potential sort of treatments it, if they might be beneficial for some patients should be available. I don't think we're there yet, you know, um, 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 on the pharmacological side at all. I think we are beginning to get there in terms of pharmacological interventions for commonly co-occurring conditions. But the big question, in that, so for example, for anxiety would be a very good example, as well as for things like ADHD. The question at the moment in terms of treating anxiety and ADHD in individuals with autism is should the sort of way in which those sort of um, drugs are being used be 
changed in some way for individuals? Is the response different in some sorts of ways? And those trials are sort of currently underway. And certainly, you know, patients in the clinic, I'm a psychologist, but patients in the clinic that I work in, you know, um, 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 some of them are on medications and some young people um, say that they sometimes find them sort of beneficial. And it's a discussion that we obviously have with the young people and the families when we see them. Um, um, in terms of you know, your comments about the sort of um, pharmaceutical industry, let me just sort of say one thing. So all the data that's being collected as part of the EU AIMS consortium at some point in the future will be publicly available. Um, two years after the end of the current funding, we've made a commitment to have anonymized um, versions of all the data sets that have been collected. And we've told the European Commission this. Um, they will be publicly available within, with some levels of sort of scrutiny, scrutiny and guardianship sort of on the web. So, you know, um, I'm not saying that sort of necessarily answers all of your sort of concerns, but I think it's a sort of uh, attempt within the consortium to be as transparent as it can be about the work, the particular work that's being undertaken um, through the partnership that the consortium's um, sort of um, undertaking. And, you know, personally, I would say that the spirit of that undertaking I would see as a positive one, but it may not satisfy everyone. Thank you. I believe we have another question over here. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions and a couple of observations. Um, one thing is uh, the, the, the final speaker was talking about addressing uh, gaps and getting added value identified through consultation with people on the spectrum, which is a great idea, and I think we need to do that. We need to involve people who are in, who have ASD or who see themselves as in that area uh, in deciding the sorts of needs that they have because very often needs are addressed that other people see as being relevant but without taking people fully into account. One of the issues though is the one that Diane t uh, pointed out at the beginning of her presentation that the vast majority of adults with ASD are not identified. Most people in the community throughout the EEC are unknown. We don't know who is there who has an ASD, and we're not canvassing their views and their opinions and their difficulties. If we're looking at more classically defined autism, the majority of people have problems that make it very difficult for them to communicate their issues because half of them are nonverbal, a lot of them have learning disabilities that make communication difficulty. Uh, part of their picture, a lot of them have social interactional problems anyway, and it makes it very difficult for them to tell you what their problems are. I mean, the, the final point on that is that you don't necessarily know what it is you need. I mean, I think, yeah, Donald Rumsfeld got, got that prize for being confusing by talking about unknown unknowns. Most people are unaware of the things that might come out from scientific research that may be highly beneficial to them. And we need to drive developments in science, partly by finding out what it is people know they need, and partly by scientific endeavours to try and improve what we can provide. All right. I'm very impressed with what I've heard of today, that uh, the idea of getting coordination across multiple groups using the same measures is fundamental to moving things forward. I mean, that's what's happening in the States. I mean, one thing I'd like to ask Tony is about how we link this in with the RDOC-based research that NIMH is funding. Because the majority of American research on, in this area is now much more based on the features that you get through something like the NIH toolbox in the profile that somebody presents with, rather than a clinical diagnosis. The, the point that one of the earlier people was making about the fact that yeah, we diagnose autism behaviorally. I mean, NIMH, after the three comparative evaluation reviews they'd done showing that over 9,000 studies gave absolutely no guidance on what to do with people, they've started funding research trying to be more specific in characterizing problems. I mean, the idea we're spending a lot of money on research is nonsense relative to the size of the problem. Martin's uh, calculations for the UK, Annually, public, uh, public sector spending is 42 billion pounds on autism supports through health, education, social work, and other services. 42 billion. The amount of money we spend on research per head is 5p. If we're spending 42 billion on service provision and next to nothing on research, it's not surprising we're not driving forward practice. Th that same 
you know, issue was picked up in a, a joint paper by Martin and an American group showing the Americans spend the same amount on provision, but vastly more per head on research. It's still just under a dollar, but it's a lot more than we're spending. Okay. But the point from that is that almost 50, uh, almost 98% of funded research at the moment is US funded. We're a drop in the ocean compared to the, the states in coming forward with research that's going to move on practice. Which is the reason I, I mentioned RDOT, because if we're diverging in the models we're using, so we're not able to make use of American research, we get all these lovely meta-analysis papers coming out, but we're not going to be able to make use of the findings. Okay, okay, thank you. I'm not sure what that question is, but I covered yeah. several Did you want, want Tony to, to comment on yeah, something? Or, or anybody else of the, from the panel? Um, I, I just want to comment on the uh, participation of the target group, the ad adult target group. Uh, sure, mostly, um, I mean, about the uh, adult research. Uh, <laughs> so I am not responsible for that, but it's the, quite the same question that we, we uh, answered before that uh, right now the Autism Europe is really working hard on um, um, somehow reinforce um, uh, the, the participation of the self advocates uh, among the Autism Europe because we know it's very important. So, but, uh, but um, you know, um, it's, um, it's, it's not easy anyway, but, but I think even this Congress is a, uh, it's a proof, proving that we're really trying to, uh, to involve all, all the self-advocates, so this is what we can do. Uh, regarding the persons with, with very severe autism, um, at the moment the, the best uh, solution is that um, uh, either the caregivers or the parents are, um, are representing them and, and I, I just hope that, that the caregivers and the, and the parents knows the, uh, that target group and, and um, um, knows what uh, um, uh, difficulties they have. But regarding the um, adult study, maybe you want to give some comment? I can give a brief com a short comment. I mean, for the, for the uh, survey for adults that we're conducting as part of the ASDEU, we're including respondents who self-identify as autistic. So they're not, it's not restricted to individuals who are, have a formal diagnosis. But if they um, identify themselves as autistic, we certainly want to hear their voice as well. Thank you.